The list is an allocated set of names grouped together, politically arranged, called many things like exclusive, intimate, intricate, specific, Berlusconi's cabinet. There are the myths and there are the facts. There's a knife or two saved for certain backs. There's foxes and hens and tightly locked houses. There's claustrophobia outside it's so crowded. Lists are designed to satiate the selected, inspire the ambitious, spurn the rejected. While they're known to achieve all of the above, should there be concern for the consequences thereof? The incroyable wouldn't care. They dismiss irate. Being of the school of thought, let them eat cake. While the bourgeoisie will tap their noses, sniffing out trouble as opposed to roses. That trouble refers to a miscellaneous bunch. One-time tourist shoppers, nouveau and such. At first waving their cash, bold and imperious, only to go gray and be branded not serious. Their displeasure at times can be paralleled to a woman scorned or unleashed Jezebel. And what about the fledglings emerging from nests? No pedigree or background from which to attest? Mercurial as it is, given the privilege to collect. An appointed position, you're one of the select. It all comes down to certain aspects of the list core. Loyalty, history, then there's force majeure. Outlaws ex exist to give uncomfortable reminders that trouble is peripheral to societal blinders. And in this digital age, it's the wild, wild west. Pew. Marketplaces crawling with cowboy capitalists. So if you're on the list, you're on it. And if you're not, you're not. Is this process of selection natural or corrupt? Let's find out. Very impressive. Thank you, Dom, for that remarkable introduction. Uh, good morning. A very warm welcome, everyone, to the, uh, the first of the Horology Forum discussions here at Dubai Watch Week. Now, uh, at the end of this week, there's a session called the Hot Potato, but uh, I rather feel that we've been delivered something of a potato piquant in having to discuss uh, what uh, Dom has just outlined as a, as a rather sensitive subject. Uh, we are, of course, discussing uh, the wait list. Uh, the irony being, of course, that if you're in this room, you are already among a privileged few. Uh, there was, in fact, a wait list for this event, I believe. And so if you've ever had to wait for a watch, you will understand, perhaps, what those who are in the corridors and beyond uh, watching on their phones are currently experiencing. Uh, my name is Robin Swithinbank. I'm a journalist. Uh, I have the pleasure of covering this industry for the New York Times and the Financial Times, among others. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you here today. Uh, but it's also my pleasure to introduce our panel uh, in, this, uh, in this train carriage setup, uh, we have with us Mr. Mohammed Siddiqui, who is the, let me get this correct, sir, the uh, chief commercial officer of our gracious host, Siddiqui Holding. You are also the so called custodian of the wait list. More or less. You might expect a little <laughs> bit of heat this morning. Uh, sitting opposite me is Mr. Adam Craniotis, who is the founder of the fast expanding uh, Red Bar group of watch enthusiasts, and also, as of this year, the editor-in-chief of Revolution USA. And to my right here is Mr. Hamdan bin Huaydi, who we are describing as a watch collector and specialist. And if you've seen what's on his wrist this morning, you'll understand exactly what I mean, as he has a, a unique Frodsham watch on his wrist, which is a spectacular Thank piece. Thank you. So gentlemen, without further ado, we should probably crack on and um, address this, uh, this topic of ours this morning. And, and I'm afraid, Mohammed, I'm going to start with you. Yes. Because, and I'm going to have to quote here, because um, you rather scattered the pigeons uh, to the four corners of the earth when in the trailer you said, and I will quote, if you're not on the list, you're, you're not, on, not the on the list. Exactly. <laughs> no matter who you are, how much money you have, who you know, we don't care. Those are your words. So if I might throw them back at you and ask, and I suppose from this we can establish that first of all, there is a list, 
There is a list. And secondly, that uh, in order to be on it, perhaps you have to be related to the gods. Uh, well, not really. Uh, it's a very clear way of us creating the list. First of all, before getting into the list, there is a wish list to get into the list. So that is already a step for, uh, for people to, to get in. The wish list being, a, a, being what exactly? A wish list to enter the wait list. Right. So it's a very simple uh, procedure. First of all, the quantity of watches as a retailer is not as what people expect us getting. Uh, the number of pieces produced by, by the brands are always limited, and uh, knowing that most of the watches that are on wait list are uh, high-end watches. So we do have a waiting list. We, 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 we respect the waiting list. And uh, it is as simple as the priority is given to regular customers, people with a history with Ahmed Siddiqui and Sons. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the case is not only with watches, it's in more or less all luxury brands today, uh, uh, without mentioning names. Uh, the hype began uh, with social media, where people who weren't watch lovers or collectors like Mr. Hamdan here, uh, starting seeing the they started to see the trends online of some watches being uh, sold at uh, premiums, mm -hmm. and suddenly we had the number of people requesting for these watches jump from a thousand to twelve thousand. So, along with my family members who are working with us, we started cleaning up the list and knowing who are the customers, who are the flippers, and who are the newcomers who just want to get the hot pieces without having any history about watches, and try to educate them, obviously by using such uh, uh, platforms like the Dubai Watch Week to, to show them that watches are not only the pieces that are difficult to get, but there are some other pieces that you can easily acquire and have them. Uh, there are many occasions where, uh, where we've uh, witnessed uh, clients coming and saying, I am a customer of this brand and I would like to acquire this watch. And uh, the funny thing, uh, we had uh, uh, a royal family from a neighboring country just a couple of days ago coming and he said that I have bought 12 Patek Philippe watches from another market and I would like to have a Nautilus. And I told him, I'm sorry, I cannot have you on the list. And he told me, why? But I am a customer of Patek. I said, you are a customer of Patek, but you're not a customer of Siddiqui. And I have customers who are loyal to Siddiqui and buying as a retailer. And any other retailer would do the same thing. Buying watches from a, a specific retailer will get the priority of having the difficult watches that are on waiting list. Uh, a few months ago, we, we were uh, again uh, cleaning up the list. And we had, for one of the hot pieces, uh, a waiting list of 3,000 people. And uh, when we filtered the list, out of the 3,000 people, there were only 200 that were considered as Ahmed Siddiqui and Sons customers. How do you define that? Uh, we have a database, we have a CRM system where we can track down the customers and follow them. Are they people who are known to you rather than people who, who uh, bring certain values when they walk through the front door? Well, it's, it's, it's not only about the individual, it's also to build and to be fair to our consumers who are regularly buying watches. Mm. And uh, to have a walk-in customer and says, I want, let's say just as an example, a Pepsi, and I don't know who he is or what history he has, what will he do with the watch? I'd rather keep it and give it to a client who has purchased one, two, three, four, five watches from me and then give him as a bonus or as a Christmas gift, a Pepsi, rather than giving someone who's just walking in and might do something else with the watch to uh, gain profit with it. Are you under pressure from the brands to maintain that strategy? Well, uh, the brands are not being involved in this. They are, however, highly uh, controlling that the pieces are given to the right clients who will wear the watch and not flip the watch the next day. Uh, it, it is a challenge for us because it will never be possible for us to control all of that. 
we had some cases where uh, friends uh, or uh, regular clients are buying watches for their friends, and the friends sell the watches. And it happened in many occasions. But again, we cannot control everything. We do try to control as much as possible what we can. Now, Adam, you've been gathering with watch enthusiasts and collectors for, for many years now. Uh, what would uh, the collector and enthusiast community have to say in response to the idea of a wait list? Uh, I, you know, I don't think there's anything that's been said that's a huge surprise. Um, you know, the way I look at it is, you know, there's a wait list, but there isn't a wait list. Uh, there's the sense that, oh, there's going to be this, this chronological order, and as long as you've gotten in there soon enough that you're going to get a piece. And I think it's, it very quickly after you get into this hobby, you're disabused of that notion, and you realize that it comes down to relationships. Um, I don't think there's anything cynical about it, per se, but uh, there's definitely a thought that if you, know, you don't know me from Adam, no pun, no pun intended, intended, of yeah. course, um, yeah, why do I get special treatment beyond you know, like, okay, we'll put you down, but eh. Um, what I find interesting is, uh, you know, speaking to, to some uh, ADs that I know, uh, you know, how people try to ingratiate themselves. Because I think the problem is, is everybody starts somewhere. And do I really need to spend six years cultivating a relationship? You know, if I am a diehard collector, I'm not a gray marketer, I'm not out to, to just flip the piece. And, I hate to say it, but yeah, you do have to put that time in. Um, I know people who have, uh, you know, they've sent, uh, you know, wedding presents to the, the children of the ADs, you know, that they do anything they can to just try and get in there and get in front so that your name is there, that they're thinking about you. Uh, but nothing is guaranteed. And, but you also have to recognize, too, that we're talking about watches. You know, these are not, this is not air that we're breathing. You know, we're very lucky to even be in the position of wanting to put our money down for something that, that technically we don't need. It still hurts, though. I mean, I'm not, I mean, how do I, I got to, why am I here? I'm sitting next to him. I want to get on the list. Yeah, yeah. You're on the wish there's, list. There's, there's, ulterior, there's an ulterior motive here. <laughs> um, Handan, you said in your trailer that you have found yourself on a wish list to be on a waiting list, yes. which is remarkably meta. Yes, exactly. I mean, in your experience, what is the difference? I have and, a good uh, experience in waiting, really. <laughs> I did wait for uh, couple of watches for a couple of years actually and I am still waiting for for a couple from independent watch uh, makers uh, there was a, a funny story I shared with some of my friends uh, a few years ago I have um, I contacted the watchmaker to be on their list and after confirming uh, they sent me a message they sent me an email saying that you're on the waiting list of the waiting list and uh, I thought they were trying to avoid me and just you know, push me away. Three months later, I received an email saying, congratulations, you're on the waiting list. <laughs> uh, How did you feel at that point? Elated, I'm sure. I'm a very, I totally understand, especially that I know uh, who's the watchmaker and the capacity and uh, the volume of production uh, mm. they do per annum. So I uh, try to adapt, especially with, uh, with the experience. It's not the first experience I've, uh, I, I went through. Second and do you empathize with the criteria that Adam was just outlining? Yes, of Getting course. onto a waiting list. For you, has it been about relationship? It, no matter how much of, money you have, no matter who you are, course, it's nothing Muhammad, to do with that. It's Muhammad all about relationship. A, I'm very close to the family. And I am on, men, on, on a waiting list as well with, with Muhammad and a couple of watches. And I totally understand. Mm. I totally understand. They cannot satisfy. Uh, uh, the whole country, you know, and everyone wants the same thing, the very same thing. Yeah, apparently so. And, uh, and uh, as he said, uh, they have to be fair. Like, there are many uh, families uh, who are clients of the family since more than 30 and 40 years, which has uh, to have the priority of having uh, the important pieces. And then comes uh, the new uh, collectors or fashions. Mohammed, it's tempting to believe that wait lists are a modern phenomenon. And we find ourselves discussing them here at Dubai Watch Week uh, for the first time. Uh, is, have, have waiting lists always existed in your experience, or is this a modern phenomenon? Uh, yes, it has existed uh, since I remember being uh, working in the company. I know that there was a waiting list. Uh, it is a challenge. It is a big challenge. Uh, people get upset. Uh, People uh, 
we had a, we had a case a uh, few months ago, a customer thinking that we get 50 Nautilus uh, 5711s a month. So <laughs> we just had to make it clear that <laughs> we don't even get that quantity in how many do you get? Five years. <laughs> I don't know how many, <laughs> but uh, it is also to educate people that the quantities that we receive are not as big as they think they are. Uh, we have to be fair. Uh, as Hamdan said, he is on the waiting list on many watches, and he had to wait for some watches one or two years through us being a close family friend, uh, uh, a regular customer, one of the top customers, he still ends up waiting. And we have few others that uh, I've seen uh, this morning here that are regular customers and are on the waiting list. We never promise the dates of deliveries, but we do promise that we will deliver to all our regular customers. Again, I will emphasize to all our regular customers. Newcomers, we will obviously entertain them, but we would like them to start with something. Uh, being in the showroom almost every day, except the weekends, uh, I pass by through a lot of uh, clients that obviously complain about not getting pieces. And uh, apart from that, the messages that we get, uh, 20, 30 messages or calls or it's not only for me, it's me, my cousins, my brothers, my sisters, my father, my uncle, we all get, and sometimes we, 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 we witness that uh, the same client is calling everyone, thinking that they would get the piece before us because of a relationship or something, but uh, again, we just pass the message that we are a company that works on ethics and we follow Honestly, we follow the waiting list. And what's really driving these waiting lists in your mind? I mean, is it, is it the supply? Is it consumer demand? Or actually, are the brands stimulating the waiting uh, list? It, it, is this, uh, it is the supply. For, uh, it is the supply in one way, and it is the, uh, the, the buzz these pieces are getting around them. Uh, you can get, in some cases, nicer watches without paying the premium in the secondary market and enjoy it even more. But because of the trend in social media, because of... Uh, Lack of awareness about this one. Yes. So all of this affects uh, the trend of how these watches are being uh, uh, looked at. Mm. Um, people uh, would always look at having the right pieces and to to acquire pieces that are double the price, triple the price. Are, are those pieces changing, uh, or have they been the same models for years and years and years? Well, uh, no, I don't think so. They have been always the same watches. I, I, I remember uh, looking at uh, one specific brand, uh, uh, Patek Philippe, with the Aquanaut and the Nautilus, if we look at the trend 15 years ago, these pieces were displayed in the showrooms. Mm. Uh, if we take the GMT Master Pepsi, I remember uh, 12, uh, 13 years ago, we had them on display with the Jubilee bracelet, which Rolex recently relaunched. Mm. And people were not interested in having them. Today, people would kill to have them. Why? That's an excellent question. Adam, <laughs> well, can you answer that yeah, question? But you, you touched on that, and a lot of it is social media. It's a, it's a double-edged sword. Uh, I think like the internet as a whole. It's, a, it's an equalizer. It's a great way to disseminate information. But it starts to bring in a, a whole new class of people, some of whom are going to become um, you know, dedicated collectors who have a real passion for it. But the flip side of that is that you have a group of people who want to buy into the hype. And so, it's not that I want a Nautilus because I know the history of the watch and, I, and I'm a fan of Gerald Jensen's designs. I want it because I'm being told that I want it. And then because I can't have it, all right, well now I really need it. And then you start to get into the whole issue again with the wait lists. And it is uh, supply and demand. It's to a point where we might be best friends and, and I want to give you this watch, but 
I don't have it. Um, and it's interesting because that does create, I don't know what the situation is with you, but I know from ADs I've spoken to, it creates a lot of friction where you do have this client who has been a, a great patron and, and possibly even a friend, and then they come in and say, well, I want to get a Submariner for uh, my son. He's graduated. And then you have to say, no, I can't do that. Now, in some cases, these are people who are not used to hearing the word no. Um, but again, all I can say is you, you have to be polite the whole time. Um, but it, it's, it, it's hard for me to say that that's a bad thing. As somebody who's trying to nurture the collector community, you know, social media, for me, has been a boon. This is how we expand. This is how we grow. This is how we get more people involved. But what I find is that a lot of these people are starting to get frustrated. And, and I do my best, too, to point and say, look, there's a whole world of watches out there. Instead of you know, going for what you're told you want, why don't you think about what it is you really want? What is it you really need? You know, it, I joke that I play the game to lose. Most of the watches I own are worth a lot less. Um, if I had to sell one at a loss, to me, that's the tax I had to pay for enjoying something. But it's very difficult, I think, to, to jump in with that philosophy. And of course, everybody is special. You know, we're all to ourselves, so then we all have to think to ourselves, well, how come I'm not getting the piece that I want? How come I have to wait? But, you know, it's, it's watches, it's time. You know, yeah, okay, so maybe exercise a little bit of that. I'm speaking to some of the brands, I think they understand the frustration. I was talking to Mr. Thierry Stern in yeah. Singapore at the uh, Watch Art Grand Exhibition six or seven weeks ago, and he admitted that uh, he would not be prepared to wait six years for a steel Nautilus. Um, is this a level of frustration that you can uh, empathize with, or are you quite prepared to play the long game? I'm, I'm, I'm still waiting for some watches. I waited for this watch for three years. I for three years? Yesterday. Three years almost, mm. two and a half, I received it yesterday. Mm. So congratulations. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's worth much. the wait, huh? Worth the wait. <laughs> but there is something about that, you know, that it, so even if you forgot you're on the list, you get that call, I mean, it's... Of course. You know, we can try to sell that. Yeah, that feeling. <laughs> Yesterday, I was uh, sitting with one of our clients, and uh, he was offered a Nautilus, not from us, from somewhere else, and he didn't take it. So going back to what Adam's saying, he just wasn't convinced on the watch, and he said, I could have easily taken it at retail and flipped it, but I wouldn't do that. I would rather not take a watch that I don't like than taking it and flipping it and then the, uh, the agents knows about it and then I'm on a blacklist and then I cannot get the watch and if I want something else I won't get it. So he said I just passed. So you have some clients that are honest and looking for what they want and not taking what they're told to be that they have to take. So. Yeah. I think it's a matter of knowing what you want. And that, that's, that leads me on to the next question, really, because although, largely speaking, we're talking about Rolex and we're talking about Patek and probably more specifically Nautilus, um, and those brands seem to be generating waiting lists of some, some considerable length, are there other brands in the meantime, uh, any of you can answer this, are there any, any other brands in the meantime who are benefiting, who are scooping up the custom from customers who perhaps aren't prepared to wait? Uh... Well, there is Audemars Piguet, there's Richard Meal, uh, and then you have a few of the independent brands that are working hard in delivering amazing watches. So you're now starting to see waiting lists develop for Richard Mille, for AP, yes. for Independence. Yes. So, and the list of, of brands that, are, that have waiting lists attached to them is, is growing? It's growing. It is growing. It is because of the... Uh, uh, information people are getting is because of what people are seeing in the market. I have another uh, client of mine who, who's been having a strong relationship with the Patek Philippe boutique in Geneva, and uh, he never bought a watch from them. He just has a relationship as a friends, and uh, they were surprised to see him coming many times a year, visiting the boutique, just saying hello to the team, and leaving. And once they felt shy and they told him, do you want to watch? And he said, no, I don't like your watches. <laughs> as simple as that. And I think he's uh, in here today without mentioning his name. <laughs> uh, he, he, his trend is buying watches 
that he loves. And he says, if a day comes that I have to sell my watches, I will lose at least 60 or 70% of the prices. But he says, I don't care. Because this is what I like, and exactly what Adam yeah, said. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's following his passion, his uh, dream, and he gets what he wants, regardless of the price, regardless of following a certain trend. And, uh, and if you give him one of the hot pieces uh, that are today, the top 10 hot pieces, he would say, even if you give me for free, I will never wear it. Hmm. Because of the trend that is going, and because knowing that wearing a watch at a higher caliber with a better movement and paying the same price that he can pay for a premium on a, hot, uh, on a waiting list watch, he says it's not worth it. Hmm. And he has a point, I think. And have, have you seen red bar guys uh, talking about watches they've been lusting after for years and years, they get on a wait list, and then maybe they get bored and think, well, actually, I'm going to spend my money somewhere else. Our brands, are you seeing brands become hotter as a consequence of people moving into collecting other brands? Well, uh, first off, I, I have seen you know, several of my friends and several collectors who have been called for very uh, hot watches right now. And yeah, they're still excited. They're very happy to get them. They're not uh, turning down the opportunity. But what we're also seeing, though, is there's a sense of, I have the money in my hand right now. I want to buy something right now. So the instant gratification part, you're not going to have satisfied no matter what. Uh, except if you start expanding you know, your horizons. So the wider net you cast, people are starting to look at brands that maybe they didn't consider before. You want a Rolex Submariner, you can't get one. But if the AD is smart, well, have you considered a Blancpain 50 Fathoms? You know, no, that's a fantastic watch. You can't say that it's worse. Um, and what I'm finding is that uh, for some brands or some ADs that they actually have to start to, it's not upsell, but it's sort of a lateral sell. Um, and I think for the collectors who are new to the hobby or maybe buying into the hype, it's a very educational uh, opportunity if they decide to take it. You know, the problem is, that at the end of the day, though, the heart wants what the heart wants. So if you really want that steel Rolex, that steel Patek, and, and these are obviously the two brands that are really um, you know, hot right now and are causing a lot of this uh, friction with the community, at the end of the day, you just have to wait. I mean, I, I wish I could sit here and say there's some silver bullet that you know, and we can give you that insight into how to get you know, past that. But at the end of the day, it's building relationships. Well, some retailers say they don't run wait lists. I was talking to one retailer back in the UK last <coughs> week who said that he feels that a wait list is the antithesis of good customer service because of the friction that it creates. I, is, is that something you've considered? Would you, or do you run wait lists because actually you think it's the right way to treat your well, customers? Well, I, I think uh, it's just a matter of communicating in the right way to the client, how does the wait list work? Um, it's difficult to promise because uh, we, uh, we ended up in some of the references to have a 12-year waiting list. A 12-year waiting yes. list? So, Can you tell us which references have a 12-year uh, waiting list? Quite a few, actually. <laughs> so, From the two brands that we've mentioned, yes. I'm assuming. So, Within this 12 years, we wouldn't know that if this watch will still exist in the collection or not. So it's always difficult to promise a, a client that he will get the watch. But we try to make it as clear as possible that it depends on his trends, depend on what he's buying, depend on his passion in watches. We can always deliver. Uh, again, last night I was uh, contacted by a client who's requested for a Nautilus two years ago. And we haven't delivered. And then I went to his profile uh, this morning. And within the two years, he's bought nothing. He's just waiting for the Nautilus. So we have other clients that are buying things that have priority on, on this client. So. He is on the waiting list, as he is a customer, but is he a regular customer or not? So we have to communicate it to the customer, explaining it to him that, listen, you are on the waiting list, but this is your status. It will take time. It might never reach. So you're quite clear with them. We are actually, quite clear with that them. That you need to deepen your relationship with us, since, by which since you mean buy more watches to, to be advanced to yes, through the waiting since, list. Since uh, January 2019, we started being more and more clear about this because uh, 
uh, a lot of people are uh, expecting to be uh, delivered the, some watches and uh, looking at their profile, it would be almost impossible. So we are communicating and telling them, thank you for your interest, but you cannot stay on the waiting list because of these reasons. However, we can offer you something else. As uh, Adam said, you know, there are always choices and, and uh, the watch industry is not depending only on these 10 or 15 models that, are, that everyone is killing to get. Mm -hmm. So there are other things. There are uh, other choices, uh, and uh, the clients and always have the choice. And of course, increasingly, there are other means of getting hold of these watches. We've talked about flipping briefly. We've talked about the secondary market briefly. But yeah. uh, the pre-owned market is, is growing at quite a pace at the moment. According to one analyst I spoke to last week, the pre-owned market is now worth $16 billion a year, which against the primary market of $50 billion a year suddenly becomes a very significant segment. And some predict, in fact, I think Mr. Govberg, uh, who you've recently gone into partnership with through Watchbox, believes that the pre-owned market may well uh, grow to be larger than the primary market within the next five to 10 years. Um, is this business of wait lists, coming back to the point, uh, is it stimulating the pre-owned market in a healthy way? Or are we concerned in some way that there, it might be an unhealthy level of growth? Well, uh, I wouldn't say it's unhealthy. It is healthy because uh, uh, the certified pre-owned watches are keeping the value of watches. Uh, it is giving an opportunity for uh, uh, watch lovers or even beginners who are entering into the watch world to, to, to acquire some pieces that, were, that they missed out or they were looking for. Not necessarily always watches that are on premium. They can even find watches that that uh, were uh, manufactured during the year they were born, for example, which is a big trend now. Uh, it is, uh, it complements uh, the business of watches, in my opinion. And uh, it is an important factor where, uh, as you mentioned, we, we just partnered with uh, Watchbox, uh, knowing that Watchbox is one of the few certified pre-owned companies where they offer you an extra two years warranty regardless of the age of the watch. The watches are uh, refurbished, uh, whether it's with their specialized uh, watchmakers or from the mother company. So it adds value to the end consumer to be uh, having this option of uh, getting a certified pre-owned. And in my opinion, and uh, I would like uh, to have the opinions of Adam and Hamdan, if uh, it, 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 it complements really well. Uh, we've, we've seen this for many and many years in the car industry, and it plays a major role in the car industry with a certified pre-owned. So we believe that this is a, a good step. Hamdan, I, I, I'm interested to know whether you would consider the pre-owned market based on uh, your appetites and uh, your particular tastes. If you're having to wait for a watch in the primary market, would you consider moving into the pre-owned space? If I don't mind. Take answer. I don't mind if, if I really wanted a piece. But it has to be, the, the premium has to be logical to me. Uh, I haven't, to be honest, uh, went to the, to the uh, secondary market. Uh, I, would, uh, I would rather wait. Uh, and anyways, most of my, my, my interests are with the independent uh, watchmaking. So uh, I can't remember when I was, uh, when I went to the secondary market uh, recently, or I would be in an auction house bidding on, on, on a piece that I really uh, mm. like, if I like something. Again, to a certain extent, or uh, to a limited roof that I would set. But Adam, I mean, can you understand it? So, I mean, if, if, you, if I've got to wait six years to get hold of the piece that, I'm, uh, that I want uh, new, uh, whereas I go and talk to one of these pre-owned retailers who says to me, I'll find you one within 30 days, but you're gonna have to pay a premium. Uh, can you understand why, why this, this segment of the market is growing, and do you think the wait lists are a big part of the cause of it? Uh, definitely. Um, you know, I think uh, to what uh, you were saying, you know, the premium has to make sense, uh, but that's going to be a different number for everybody. You know, you have to know what your limit is, first of all, before you go into that. But uh, as somebody who's been buying pre-owned for years, um, you know, I have a certain amount of knowledge that I know I can go in and buy privately, and I, I kind of know what I'm getting. I think what these services are offering now is uh, 
like you said, like the certified pre-owned aspect where, you know, the whole caveat emptor aspect of it is kind of addressed. Mm -hmm. So when you go to a watch box, you know, you know you're getting what you're paying for as opposed to that sort of waiting until the box comes and opening it and just praying that you didn't get a brick or you didn't get, you know, exactly. some fake watch, you know, with, with parts from China in it. Um, but yeah, it, the wait list is a huge part of that for a certain subset of these watches. But it's also, again, you can find anything. So do you really need to have that? I think when you start looking, and one thing I will do, which I think a lot of people could probably uh, identify with is, yeah, my wife hates it because I usually do it while I'm lying in bed on my phone, but I'm, I'm just going through and seeing what's for sale and seeing what the prices are and, and sort of trying to build my own fantasy uh, watch box. No pun intended, again, you know. But, uh, but yeah, the wait list is, uh, is really at the crux of all of that. Um, do you think, Mohammed, that um, the growth of pre-owned and the not sudden, but let's say relative availability of some of these very in-demand pieces may actually bring wait lists down in the future, or do you see no. the opposite trend? I think uh, the opposite trend. The more demand goes in the certified pre-owned or the secondary market, the more tougher the waiting list gets. Mm because more people want them. Even though every year there are more and more watches coming into the market? There, there are more and more watches coming in the market every year, but the quantity is not increasing in terms of production. And uh, I know for a fact uh, with Patek Philip, they're not even thinking of adding another five pieces to, to these hot pieces. The, uh, they, they came to a point to they were considering of canceling them. Obviously, it wouldn't make sense, but because of the focus of clients are going to few references and forgetting the, the root of the brands, it's affecting, it might affect in the long term the, the, the image of the brand. Uh, the whole Nautilus line and the Aquanaut wouldn't even be 15% of their total production, which mm. is something very small, and they're never considering in, in, in increasing the, the capacity of that. Mm. So the, that, that will always, year by year, increase the waiting list and the people it, looking It's interesting it. that you mentioned the image of the brand, because one of the things that occurs to me about the, the very concept of a wait list is that philosophically, uh, a wait list is an exclusive thing. And uh, we're all seeing uh, the idea that inclusive luxury is perhaps a little bit more popular, particularly among a younger demographic. Does the concept of a wait list at some point become outmoded? Does it at some point become a case of the retailer or the brand shoot themselves in the foot because their image becomes, you can't have what we've got, unfortunately, it doesn't matter who you are? Uh, well, everyone can have what they want. So again, uh, it's how to get it, you know? Uh, it's going through a certain criteria to get what you want. Today, in this uh, world, everything is possible. I wouldn't say everything is possible with money. It's not necessarily with money. Mm. It's, it's a matter of relationship. It's a matter of being a loyal customer. It's a matter of showing interest. It's, it's a matter of having passion for something. It's a matter of not thinking of it as a quick money. It's a matter of... Uh, uh, a lot of criteria that, uh, that shows how you can get things. Uh, but surely, if, you're, if all you want is a Nautilus, and we keep coming back to that as an example, but if all you want is the Nautilus, like your customer who's been on the wait list for two years, if, if the journey for him to get that Nautilus is to build a relationship with you by coming back and investing in three or four other pieces, but he doesn't want to, do we not get to a situation where he's unlikely to end up with, with that watch? Go to Watchbox. So, okay, so then that feeds the pre-owned yes, market. Yes, yeah. yes, mm -hmm. So that, that, that is still open for people who are uh, not looking at uh, watches as a passion or as a, uh, uh, he doesn't consider, he or she doesn't consider himself as a collector mm -hmm. and they want just to have one piece from a specific model, uh, the certified pre-owned market is ready for that. So do we get to a situation there where the primary market for some of those brands, that, that, that small cohort of brands, becomes almost exclusive to collectors because they're going to have to be routine, regular watch buyers before they can consider buying into those brands or extending exactly. their collection? And, and, and today, 
the, the community of uh, watch collectors, watch lovers uh, is growing tremendously. Mm -hmm. We see that growth uh, strongly in, in, in the Middle East. Uh, again, with, uh, with what we present here at the Dubai Watch Week, we are growing that passion for, for, for our customers and friends and uh, through, through Dubai and hopefully one day to the world. Uh, it is a platform where uh, people are uh, getting educated about not only having a watch as an investment, but rather to understand the beauty uh, of the watches and how much time and effort is given to create uh, such a beautiful timepiece. Uh, a good friend of uh, mine once said that a watch can be considered as uh, expensive as a Picasso taking the square centimeter to create uh, a nice painting and the same square centimeter or millimeter to create a watch, ratio-wise, uh, a watch is worth even more. Depending on how many layers you look at, I suppose. Depends that as well, yes. <laughs> uh, Adam, do you find yourself having conversations with your Red Bar uh, community about inclusive luxury versus exclusive luxury? I mean, you guys talk about Swatch and G-Shock uh, when you get together, and there's sort of, there are no watches that are, that are considered outside of, of what you guys will discuss. It's definitely part of the discussion. Um, I, I, it's, it's part of a discussion industry-wide, of course. Uh, you know, part of Red Bar initially, though, was to always speak to everything. You know, we're, we're not snobs, so to speak. But, um, it's, uh, it, it's just, it's tough, you know? It, it's supposed to be an exclusive uh, world to begin with. These are expensive watches, they're you know, made by hand meticulously, and so it's a little bit disingenuous to say that, no, but I'm upset because it's, it's too inclusive. Uh, well, but that's sort of the point. Um, I think that people mix up, like they take it too personally when they can't get what they want immediately, but it's not necessarily personal when the watches don't even exist. You know, and that's the joke with certain pieces, is you know, somebody thinks you're getting 50 of these a month, and in fact, you're lucky, most retailers are lucky to get one or two. Um, so it's not exclusive because they want to turn people away intentionally. No, this is a business. You, you, to stay in business, you actually have to sell stuff. Um, but it's, uh, it, it's definitely a part of that conversation always. I think what we, what we do see is that some people, as a reaction to that, will start looking at other pieces you know, a little more charitably. And maybe you're wearing this watch as sort of an anti-watch now. Well, I can't have that or that. And even if I could, I don't want it. But now I'm wearing this. You know? So maybe I'm wearing a Swatch. Maybe I'm wearing a G-Shock to make that statement. But in your heart, you, you kind of know what you want. So it'll always be part of that industry. Yeah. I uh, for you, Hamdan, uh, obviously, the, well, I say obviously, the, the issue of exclusivity, of being able to access watches from the, the, the small list of brands that Mohammed has, has just mentioned, does that for you uh, make the process of collecting more exciting? Uh, do, do, you, do you appreciate the fact that, uh, that the club is increasingly exclusive, should we say? Of course, no one likes to wait. <laughs> no one likes to wait, but uh, if, you have to, uh, if you have to wait, what can you do? You have to go through this process. Uh, there are some pieces we don't wait for, but there are many pieces that we're waiting for, we waited for. So uh, eventually, uh, it's in their hands, in their hands. You know? uh, they're the watchmakers. We cannot force them, and we cannot force the company. As, uh, as Mohammed said, uh, there are priorities, and uh, the, close, the closer uh, clients uh, uh, to, the, to the family, um, who are uh, regular customers or customers since decades uh, would not wait as uh, the new customer or the, uh, the new buyer. But no, I don't mind, uh, I don't mind the wait. I re it, it is not trouble to me at all, not at all. Patience is a virtue, yeah. as my mother always used to say. Uh -huh. um, what you won't be able to see, uh, those of you in the audience, is that there is a clock here, uh, which is timing down how long we have left to speak, and it's, uh, it's approaching zero which means that it's, uh, it's now time to uh, uh, open the floor to you. And we have a couple of roving mics that uh, will move around the floor. I suspect some of you have either preloaded questions, Mr. Dowling, or whether yours is uh, preloaded or has slipped into the barrel while we've been talking, I don't know, but I suspect it'll be fired in our direction imminently. So why don't we start with you? 
Good morning. The essence of a wait list implies that there's also a hot list of watches that people desperately want. What is the role, what is the split of the roles between horology and fashion in determining what goes on the hot list? Well, I think uh, the wait list or the hot lists are created by all of us, as in watch lovers. I would just mention that me being a guy who likes watches, not as an agent. We create what goes on demand. And uh, these pieces are created by me talking about the piece, informing Hamdan, informing Robin, informing Adam, informing Mr. X, Mr. Y, Mr. Z. We end up all wanting the watch, and the agent only has three pieces coming. Who would get it? So I think that the trend of the hot pieces is created by, by the customers themselves, the social media, and then it goes on from there. No, that's pretty much it, exactly. Um, yeah. do, you, do you find yourself collecting based on what you think is fashionable or what you think is no, horological what beautiful? I like. I collect what I like. I but have, how would you I define what I you have, like? I have standards uh, that I follow. And uh, based on my standards, I, uh, I buy what I like. Um, uh, Aquanauts, Nautiluses are not on my list. They, they never were. I, I like traditional watchmaking, especially the Finnish, especially the vintage patics. I follow Finnish, good quality. Uh, this is what I follow, but not... Uh, Perhaps it begs the question as well of whether or not horology is becoming fashionable in a way. As people become more and more educated about watchmaking and how, what goes into making a mechanical watch, is, is horology becoming fashionable? Definitely. Uh, you know, more people know about it who didn't know about it. It, it certainly made my life a little easier amongst uh, my friends and family who now understand a little bit more about what I do and that there's some broader appeal to it. And that, of course, filters down to the whole issue of a wait list. You know, there are more people involved. Good morning. My name is Mohamed Liafai, and thank you very much for this great discussion. And uh, I'll, I'll be talking about the brand new uh, watches, just not to upset Watchbox. Okay. Now, instead of having uh, a waiting list, why don't we take this opportunity and find um, some uh, solution like an internal auction within Sadiqi Group that instead of paying the gray market, no, take the margin, take the, the, the extra money and give it back to the so society in terms of not only charities, maybe uh, some training center for watchmaking, maybe financing the, the, uh, uh, the watches, maybe insurance, captive insurance for some pieces. We so are, is, is there any... any yes, I can answer you on that. Thank if you very much. Go for it. Allow me. That's you. We, we had this uh, case a uh, few years ago when uh, when Richard Mill launched the RM3501 final edition in white. It was a limited edition of 35 watches and uh, we had 37 clients wanting it. And we only got one watch. <laughs> so, so you make the math. We thought about doing that, but being an agent and representing a brand is not fair to do that to our end consumers. So we had to be fair enough to see amongst the 37 clients who requested the watch, who was the number one client to Ahmed Siddiqui and Sons for Richard Mean, and we offered him the watch. It will never be fair as an agent to, to, to do an auction, even if it goes for uh, uh, a social responsibility or a social cause or a charity. It is uh, not ethical to do it. Thank you. I think we've got time for perhaps two or three more. Miguel. Uh, question to Mohamed Siddiqui. Okay, so um, the flippers, which is a new category that uh, has been existing for a while now. So what does uh, someone uh, like you and uh, how does your company deal with, with that sort of menace? Because uh, flippers are, are not well, well viewed in terms of, uh, um, you know that there will be somebody that is going to sell 
to, the, to buy, to sell immediately afterwards for, for a profit. So what does your company uh, envision uh, regarding that problem? And w in your relationship with, with the brands, what do brands do to, pre uh, to prevent that? I can imagine that the profile of your customers is not one of the, a buyer that goes and sells the watch afterwards, but can you tell us a, a little bit? Well, the, from the brand's perspective, if, if they find out that one watch was pre-sold uh, or uh, resold uh, or flipped within a very short period, they alert us if they find it somewhere or something. From our side, it's a very simple procedure. If we find out that someone flipped it, we blacklist them. And they will never get a watch again. Yeah, let me just add something. I heard that in the UK, uh, Rolex retailers were uh, holding the um, warranty. The warrant for, for one year. So, uh, can you give us some more? Honestly, in my opinion, I don't think so. It's fair for the end consumer whether he will flip the watch or he will keep the watch. Uh, I have no right to keep the, the warranty because once he pays uh, for the watch, he has all the right to take everything. Uh, we, we, we thought about having this for some of the brands, but uh, again, we thought it wouldn't be right from our side to do that, to stop customers from acquiring all the, all the pieces. Uh, I remember around 11 years ago, we sold a watch to a prominent businessman and a collector and a customer, uh, a very sought after watch. And uh, a few months later, we found the watch on an auction where we were uh, uh, approached by the brand telling us that this watch was sold by your company and it was in an auction. Uh, and it was one of the first cases that we had uh, in 2006, I think, or 2007. Uh, for the flip of watches very quickly. So the brand didn't have any concern, but they were just worried to understand why did the client do that. So I contacted the client and uh, just casually without pinpointing at him or anything, and I told him, why did you sell the watch? And he said, if I burn the watch or I throw it in the sea, it's none of your business, which is correct. He has the right to do whatever he wants to do with it, but it's my job in the future to make sure that I am careful with him or even maybe avoid giving him some watches. Question up on the left here. Or who's got the mic? Actually, microphone? over here. Oh, hi. Yeah, hi. My name is Man Al Mullah. Uh, just uh, a query on the list. You said the waiting list, there is a wish list behind it. Yes, last night we were talking, me and you, about a specific watch, and uh, you highlighted on something that is very, I just want to see if it's the trend moving forward in the future. In the early 90s, when you go to a Ferrari dealer and you want a supercar, the factory have to give its blessing to that supercar to the customer. And uh, last night, me and Mohammed we were talking about a specific watch, a unique watch, and uh, he said that it comes from the factory on our client list. I don't know if this is going to happen for unique watches in the future. Will that trend move forward? I want a specific unique watch. I, I think the, the, the brand principles are trying to control who the watches are going to. Uh, the specific brand that we spoke about last night, uh, they are even following up the secondary market to make sure that none of the watches are being resold. And if they find anything and they know exactly who it went to, they blacklist them. And they will avoid giving them. And it's, again, it's, it's, it's for uh, specific projects that they work on. It will never be on, a, uh, on all the lines. It's, it's very limited products that they work on. I think we have time for one more yes. question. My friend's down here. My name is Hamad Amouhi. Uh, I, I, I wrote a small article the other day in WhatsApp. I actually sent it to Mohammed. I think the social media and the waiting list is creating what I call a Jaragenta curse. <laughs> what happened basically with AP? 
1972. Where are the classic watches of AP? Gone. So I'm worried about Patrick Philip as well. So everybody wants a Natalis now. Natalis is what? 1976. Okay, where are the other watches? Where are the classic lines of Patek Philippe? So this phenomenon, I think, is a very bad thing for Patek Philippe and Royal Oak or AP or other brands. So whatever waiting list you guys are talking about, I think it's something really bad for the brands. Well, well uh, to see, won't we? I think Patek Philippe won't make the mistake of Audemars Piguet to focus on one line a uh, few clients are saying that Audemars Piguet should change their name to Royal Oak <laughs> uh, because it's the only model that's moving. Obviously, with the introduction of 1159, code 1159, uh, they are trying to change the trend. But uh, Patek Philippe will never get into that uh, situation, and their focus is still on complicated watches, classic watches, and it will stay always like that. As I mentioned, they were really considering of canceling the Nautilus line and focus on what they really do. Uh, obviously, they cannot cancel it because it is part of the collection. But again, as I said, it's a very small percentage of what they do. And uh, they will never even think of increasing the production on these lines. Thank you. Uh, that really is it, I think. I I'd just like to thank our panelists. Adam, Mohammed, Hamdan, thank you so much for joining us, and thank you all for being here this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.